This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Frame. Mother's Day is almost here. What are you getting her? Something that shows you care. Something that makes her feel loved. Something that won't stress you out. Something like the Skylight Frame. The Skylight Frame is the perfect gift. It's a touchscreen photo frame your whole family can upload photos to from wherever they are in the world. It's a way to share with her all the moments that matter. It sets up in seconds. You can even make sure that it's already loaded with photos when your mom opens her Mother's Day gift. And her Skylight Frame can hold thousands of the treasured photos you share. It's an easy, heartfelt way for mom to stay connected with those who matter most. It really is the perfect gift. Now, as a special Mother's Day offer for our listeners, Get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightframe.com slash easy. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby-related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. I'm your host for Yoga Birth Babies, and today I am talking about the fifth vital sign. And you may hear that and think, well, what is that? I speak with Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. She's a certified fertility awareness educator and a holistic reproductive health practitioner and the author of the new book, The Fifth Vital Sign. In this book, she debunks the myth that regular ovulation is only important when you want children and by recognizing your menstrual cycle as a vital sign. So she and I talk a lot about how your menstrual cycle is a reflection of your overall health. We talk about breastfeeding as contraception. We talk about fertility awareness. So anyone that has a menstrual cycle, I think this is very important for you to listen to, to really understand what it means and what a a healthy cycle looks like. Before we jump into that conversation, I just want to give a shout out to Alexandra Baldwin. She recently left a rating and review on the Yoga Birth Babies podcast on iTunes. And every now and then I jump onto iTunes and see what's going on there. And because I'm a numbers junkie, it was quite a pleasant surprise to see this new review there. So I'm just going to read it quickly. I love listening to this podcast. Deb is so thoughtful and brings on the most interesting guests. It's one of my go-to podcasts for long walks in the park. I feel empowered to support my partner through her pregnancy. Thank you, Alexandra, for leaving that rating interview. And I'm so glad that this is giving you something that can support your journey as well as your partner's journey through pregnancy. So if you're a listener here and you want to just add a little extra judge to the podcast so that other people can hear it and find it, please take a moment and leave a rating or review or even a donation from our website page. I also want to announce that I'm in full gear for my next release of Who's Afraid of the Pregnant Yogi. It is up on the website. You you can start by registering now. I'm going to take 20 students. We had 12 last time. I think I'm ready to go up to 20 students and it will start on April 2nd. Again, registration's already open. So who's afraid the pregnant yogi is for yoga teachers who may not feel totally comfortable when a pregnant student walks into their class. And our last round, we actually had people already certified in prenatal yoga and they felt super confident to teach a prenatal class but not so confident about how to interweave that into an open level class. So maybe that's something that you resonate with, or maybe you're a newer teacher and you don't know or don't feel confident in modifications. So I take you through a five week online course and we cover all different aspects of pregnancy and how to interweave those modifications based on the anatomical and physiological changes of the pregnant body so that you can feel confident with your modifications, keep your class safe and keep your class moving without feeling like you're stumbling over what to do. So check that out. It's on my website, prenatalyogacenter.com, or you can look under who's afraid the pregnant yogi.com. And then last announcement, I can't believe that it's, that we're recording this in February. And at this point, the fall New York teacher training is already half full. So we have eight spots left for the fall. And we finalized the plans for Charlotte, North Carolina. We'll be back at yoga one. So check all that out if you want to continue to study with me. All right. So I have talked enough. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to jump right into my conversation with Lisa. Enjoy. 
With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey, Lisa. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, so fun. I'm really excited to speak to you because I feel like that with my podcast, Yoga Birth Babies, we talk so much about obviously yoga and pregnancy and birth and babies, but I feel like sometimes we forget to look at the whole body's health and especially pre-baby, you know, like yes. menstruation <laughs> and the menstrual cycle and what, because all that leads Two babies. So. Right? <laughs> kind of important. <laughs> yeah, kind of important, especially also then we can talk about post baby. You know, like I think this is just a part of um, women's health that we don't always get to. So I love that we're going to dive into that today because I have to say it's not my um, strongest point of education. So maybe I'll learn a little something or two. So great. So let's just jump into what brought you into this whole world and a little bit about yourself. Yes, no, for sure. My experience uh, coming into fertility awareness, I think it's an interesting story because I I discovered it really young. I was about 18 when I stumbled across fertility awareness and I had used the pill for um, painful periods and heavy periods because I was super athletic at, back in the day and it was kind of hard to like do all of that and deal with like crazy period cramps at like 15 years old. Yeah. Um, and so because of that, I wasn't really taking the pill properly, like for conception, like for um, birth control purposes. Like I wouldn't take it at the same time, but I was like a hyper nerd. So I read the insert and I knew that you needed to in order to, to rely on it. So when I needed birth control, I actually didn't feel comfortable with the pill. So I feel like I was kind of like a, like an anomaly. Um, I remember thinking to myself, like, okay, I'm going to have to use condoms all the time, Um Anyways, so then why would I also take the pill? Because I was also, I, I just had concerns even at a young age about the pill's effect on my body mm -hmm. because I had these issues with like heavy, painful periods. Every time I would go off the pill, they were still heavy and painful. So mm -hmm. I, I was very much aware that it wasn't actually doing anything to help me and fix it. And I really wanted to find out what was wrong because I felt like it shouldn't be that way. Um, so right around that time that I needed birth control and I decided that I was going to use condoms, um, I discovered fertility awareness and I, you know, I was, um, this is my first year of university and I went to this talk and a woman, Inga Musio, who wrote the book, Cunt, and in, uh, and in uh, Declaration of Independence, it's called, um, she was the first one that introduced me to the idea that I, you know, you're not fertile every day, that there's only a small window of fertility that you can identify by paying attention to your cervical position and your cervical mucus and, you know, to, you know, doing your temperatures and things like that. And that was what started it for me. I grabbed Taking Charge of Your Fertility, I ran to the bookstore, and I just so happened to be at this, um, the one place in um, North America. So back then, it was like around the year 2000-ish, um, Justice College, which is one of the only kind of secular um, organizations that teaches fertility awareness and certifies instructors, they were physically located in Edmonton where I was going to school. And there were a, groups of women that met every month that were, some of them were certified, some of them were training, but basically teaching other women to chart. So quite literally, like at my school, <laughs> I was going to these monthly meetings, learning how to chart my cycles when I was like 18, 19. That's amazing. And I know, right? And then, <laughs> um, and then I, it didn't take long for me to start attending as a, like a, a member. And then also I did a training way back then to teach. And so I was teaching this stuff in my early twenties. And, uh, you know, that was, so this whole journey for me has been almost 20 years and that's really how it came to be. What shifted for me as it does for many women, just in the general sense of like life changes mm -hmm. when I had my first son. So he's now six, but when I had my first son, it was right around, like I was, I had him the day after my 30th birthday. So it's like right around that time when everyone's trying to have babies, you know, your Facebook feed is full of kids. Um, you know, you're starting to have conversations with your friends who are trying to conceive, some are having miscarriages, some are having difficulties. And I really felt this overwhelming sense of responsibility because 
still, even though I had been in this field for so long and I'm familiar with all this stuff, the average woman has absolutely no idea about her fertility and her menstrual cycle. It's getting better now, but even now, it's really very, very few, if any, women have any idea of this because we're not taught. And that's really what started me to get more out there, like, you know, start an online presence, do a podcast, write this book, because it's really... Like I see the need and women really just need to, to know. And if our education systems aren't doing it, then we have to do it. I, I totally agree. And I, I want to just echo that. Um, I started, I got aware, actually, my husband was the one that told me about the fertility awareness. <laughs> love it. Love it. I know. <laughs> You're not the first woman who I've heard who said that. I love it every time I hear it. Um, you know, clearly, and you know, I, I obviously knew what my period was and I knew what menstruation was and I had a basic sense and I, I knew ovulation, but he was the one that actually brought that to my attention about the charting um, and <laughs> cervical <laughs> mucus. He dated a woman who was also uh, charting, so I think that's how he knew. Um, and he told me, he's, I think he's the one that got me um, taking charge of fertility. So I love it. I, I know. He's very open-minded. Um, so it wasn't until that period of my life which is my uh, mid early mid thirties that I was even really aware of this, and then soon thereafter we were talking about after I got married, started talking about having kids and charting, and we could talk about that because I found it to be a little bit of a pain in the neck. Um, but then you know I remember talking to some of my other friends. We all started having kids around the same time, and one of my friends actually didn't know that there were times within a cycle that were more fertile than others. She just had, she's like, isn't it all the time? Cause that's what her mom always said. You always have to use contraception cause you always can get pregnant. And she just thought she could always get pregnant. Um, so when she was trying, she didn't realize like focus on certain times. So I think this is something that slightly maybe a scare tactic for some, like you can always get pregnant. Um, <laughs> And others just, it's not in their education. So can you jump into a little bit about what is fertility awareness? Yes, absolutely. You hit on so many important points. And I think to frame the discussion of fertility awareness, it's helpful to kind of call out some of those myths about the menstrual cycle. And I can resonate with your friend because when I was in school as a young lady in junior high school, I was, I remember specifically being taught and I feel like it was a scare tactic. I went to a Catholic school and I was a, you know, growing up in the nineties and it was like, if you have, if you have sex, you're going to get pregnant. <laughs> and, but then at that time also, it was very much like, and you'll get AIDS and die. Like it was quite, <laughs> like it was very much like, because that was the time, right? Like it was a completely different time yeah. than it is now. And that was literally like the messages I took from <laughs> junior high school class was that if I ever had sex with another human, I was definitely getting pregnant. Like, and dying. That, <laughs> and then if I didn't use the condom, I was going to contract a, um, uh, a, a, an HIV or, or like a, um, an STI, like a fatal one. <laughs> so anyways, um, but I can really echo that. So for what I, the way I kind of frame that, and I, I suppose it could be a bit controversial, but I don't know if it is or not, but I feel like setting women up with that misinformation, because we're taught that, a lot of us are taught that, and we're not taught why. So we're not taught how our bodies actually work. We're just taught that this kind of imminent threat of pregnancy is always there. And that really sets us up for taking a contraceptive method that provides 24 seven protection. Um, so for me, the way my mind works was that when I discovered that I wasn't fertile all the time. So when I was like 18 ish and that all of a sudden to me, it was like, well, why would I be on a birth control that gives me 24 hour protection seven days a week? If I'm only fertile for about a week, each cycle, mm -hmm. So to me, all of a sudden, like, I know it doesn't resonate with everybody. And I know you mentioned when you were charting, it was a pain in the neck. My, my, you know, even as a fertility awareness educator, I have no misgivings that every single woman is going to want to chart their cycles and use this as a birth control method, because it's just not how it is. That's why we have different kinds of birth control options. And uh, as women, we're going to resonate with what we resonate with. And even at different points of our lives, for some women, there's going to be a point of their life where maybe fertility awareness makes sense, but other points that it doesn't. And so, like, this is really about the knowledge. I think as women, we all need to understand that basic, like, how our body works. And then we get to decide how, what we're going to do with that. 
knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, But fertility awareness, so to answer your question, um, it's a basic understanding of your cycle. So it really demystifies what's going on with our reproduction. And it's based on monitoring three main fertile signs, which is our cervical mucus and our basal body temperature. So taking your temperature you know, every day in the morning before you get out of bed, your resting temperature and uh, your cervical position. And what's interesting is that the way that our menstrual cycles work, there's only a small window of fertility each cycle. So it's about six days. And of course, if you're using the method as birth control, you're going to have to add a buffer around that. But um, the reason that it's six days is because as you approach ovulation, you start, your ovaries start producing more and more estrogen. And that estrogen triggers your cervix to make cervical mucus. And so although we're not taught about it, generally speaking, as women, a lot of us have had the experience of it, but we just didn't know what it was. So for instance, if you've ever had that feeling of wetness and you think, oh my goodness, my period's coming and you run to the bathroom, but there's no period. Um, If you've ever had the experience of thinking you actually have an infection (laughs) because you notice you have discharge, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. and you even go to the doctor and maybe even get a prescription, but your your test is clear. Um, So mucus can look either like, you know, clear raw raw egg whites, like that kind of like this clear stretchy, Mm -hmm. um, or it can look like creamy white hand lotion. And for some women, they might not have large quantities, but during there'll they'll be a, a point in their cycle where they go to the bathroom and they're wiping and it's like really slippery or maybe they feel like they have to wipe several times until it feels dry again. Um, but really, that happens as you approach ovulation and your mucus is really, really neat. Um, it's got a lot of amazing qualities, but I think it's best known for being able to keep sperm alive for up to five days. So in this tiny window of fertility, basically, um, like just to kind of put this into perspective, um, you would produce mucus on average, like two to seven days before ovulation. So if you were to be checking for this and looking for it, and you notice you had mucus on like Monday or Tuesday, um, you could have sex on Monday or Tuesday when you have this mucus, the mucus is going to draw sperm into your cervical crypts. It's going to keep it alive for up to five days and, um, you know, kind of release it into your uterus and fallopian tubes around ovulation. It's really neat. And so you could ovulate on Friday and actually get pregnant because you had sex on Monday or Tuesday. Um, But then outside of that window, your cervix is closed, the mucus is not flowing, your vagina is acidic. After ovulation, you you only ovulate once in the cycle. So after ovulation, um, you produce progesterone and that causes some specific physiological changes, including raising your temperature, um, shutting down your mucus production, closing your cervix, changing the position of your cervix inside of your vagina. And so after ovulation, you know, the, the, the candy shop is closed. Like, <laughs> nothing can, can happen and you actually can't get pregnant for the rest of your cycle because there's no egg. The sperm can't survive. And this is a scientifically proven method. So it's, um, it's, it's really, really interesting because it's basic anatomy that we really should just be taught kind of standard as, as young, young ladies growing up. Mm-hmm. And I- okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. ChumbaCasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Calendar. Let's be real. Running a household can be exhausting and chaotic. And finding the perfect Mother's Day gift, it's not exactly a no brainer. Until now. The Skylight Calendar is the best way to organize the family and give everyone, especially mom, some peace of mind to enjoy the things that matter most. The Skylight Calendar is a smart, touchscreen calendar that keeps track of and manages the chores, dinner planning, groceries, and to-dos for the whole family. The Skylight Calendar automatically syncs each family member's digital calendars and displays them all together on one color-coded touchscreen. It even doubles as a digital picture frame so you can finally share all those special moments that are just sitting on your phone. As a limited time offer for our listeners, get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight calendar when you go to skylightcal.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-C-A-L dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightcal.com slash easy. Also, when you're tracking, people can then start to figure out their their cycle because, I, you know, a lot of people are like, okay, day 14, I'm ovulating, but that's assuming 
everybody has a, a 28 day cycle. Um, so I think this can also just give people a little bit more information, especially if they're trying to conceive, they could be getting frustrated. Why am I having such a hard time? Well, maybe your cycle is 32 days. Maybe your cycle is 34 days. Like, and then they're just not trying around the right window. Is that correct? Well, yes, absolutely. That's such a good point, and I'm glad that you brought it up because it, it really hits on a lot of the myths. Fertility awareness, when you have that understanding of your cycle, it really smashes a lot of the common myths that we're taught. So, you know, we're taught that ovulation always happens on day 14 and your cycles are always 28 days. And a lot of women who are trying to conceive will specifically time sex based on those days. And even women who are having difficulty conceiving might go to their you know, physician and their physician will advise them to have sex based on a specific you know, date. Mm-hmm. Uh, so start having sex on day eight and da, da, da. Um, And what a lot of women may not realize, for, for some women, you can be inadvertently using fertility awareness as a birth control method. Because since there's a small window, if you don't hit the window, you can't get pregnant. That's actually a birth control method. Um, so, you know, a healthy cycle ranges in length from about 24 to 35 days. And then there's women whose cycles fall outside of those parameters who might have different health challenges. And with that said, if if that's the range of a healthy cycle, that means ovulation can then range mm-hmm. anywhere from day 10 to 23 in that kind of like like healthy cycle kind of window. If you think about it that way, that's a pretty big range. And there are women for whom, so fertility challenges are complicated. So we don't want to just say like every single woman just has to have sex on her mica states and she's going to get, because that's not true because there's more than one, you know, challenge to fertility. But there is a, a percentage of women for whom they discover fertility awareness. They learn to time not based on the day of their cycle, but based on when they see mucus because mucus is is what's telling you that you're approaching ovulation. It's going to keep the sperm. Like that's what's telling you that you're fertile. So regardless of the day of the month, it's like when you see mucus before you've ovulated, that's when you have the sex. So there's a percentage of women for whom they start to do that. And maybe for them, that means they're having sex on day five, day six, or day 21. Mm -hmm. Um, But either way, they sort that out and they get pregnant. So how long does someone need to chart to try to start to see their average? Three months, six months? Well, and see, that's an interesting question because um, I actually discourage my clients from trying to predict ovulation. So yeah, um, with fertility awareness, so a really great analogy that one of my mentors uses is, so we have this sense of the rhythm method, that's the history, Mm -hmm. and the rhythm method is basically what you said you know, getting an idea of your average so that you can guess when ovulation is going to happen next cycle. Um, and so, you know, that, that method, a lot of people associate fertility awareness with the rhythm method and say that it's not effect, like fertility awareness is an effective birth control, because when you try to go based on averages, you're really guessing mm-hmm. because ovulation can fluctuate from cycle to cycle. And that's the challenge. It's not always the same. And you can't actually predict exactly when ovulation is going to happen in the cycle. But fortunately, you don't have to. So when you're charting your cycles, if you start to really get that it's your mucus that tells you when you're fertile, like you don't have to have sex on ovulation day. So that's another myth. The myth is that you have to try to have sex on ovulation day. Now, I'm not saying it's not a good idea. Like, it's it's helpful to have sex on ovulation day, sure. But when you understand the anatomy, the physiology, that you have sex on your day of mucus, your days of mucus, and your mucus keeps the sperm alive for up to five days. So back to my example of, like, you could have mucus on Monday. Mm -hmm. And if you have sex when you have mucus, the mucus is going to keep the sperm alive until Friday. And maybe that's when you ovulate. So you didn't have to try to time sex on ovulation day. You needed to time sex when you had the mucus. That's when you're fertile. That's a whole shift in the way people think about it, right? Right, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a totally different thing, right? And so um, when you kind of can get your mind around that, the analogy that my mentor uses is like when you try to get a sense of your averages, it's like you're looking at the weather forecast to try to figure out if it's raining today. Or you could like step outside. Is it raining? <laughs> Or yeah, not. like how many times have you looked at your phone and like, well, it says it's raining, but I don't see rain. Or the opposite yes. way, like, um, my phone says it's not raining, but I see the rain. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So then when you are when you really kind of wrap your head around fertility awareness, we're not actually doing a weather forecast. We're literally like Looking you're going at to the what bath. is showing you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're well, then can you talk, you okay. can you talk a little bit about the temperature? Because that's something that always confused me. So I remember at one time 
reading like you can't you couldn't have moved to get an accurate temperature and like I might have woken up at like four to run to the bathroom and I'm like oh I ruined it because I got up and I'm waking up at six or six thirty so can you talk a little bit about what someone's looking for when they're taking their temperature and what are the parameters around that Yes, yes. No, definitely. Um, I suppose I should start by saying that your temperature, so you're taking it, um, like what it's measuring is your resting metabolic rate. And so what you're trying to get at is like if you, um, in an ideal scenario, you would go to sleep and have at least five hours of uninterrupted sleep. So the, the kind of thought behind it is that you're laying down at rest for long enough that your body's kind of resetting to this base level of metabolism. So you're actually kind of measuring your base level, um, the lowest uh, expen- uh, energy expenditure. And the reason that we care about this is because after ovulation, you you, you produce a significant amount of progesterone. Your progesterone actually surges. Without ovulation, you know, if you're not ovulating, you're not producing progesterone. And this progesterone has a thermogenic effect on the body. And it's so cool for like nerdy, sciencey people, mm-hmm. or even in general, because you can plot it on a graph, right? And then yeah. after ovulation, it goes up and it's like, and it does that every cycle. It's really neat. Um, but what that means is that it doesn't give you any prediction. It doesn't help you to predict ovulation at all because this is something that happens after ovulation. So it's really helpful when you're charting because it helps you to pinpoint about when ovulation happened. Like, you know, outside of an ultrasound, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, on your ovary every day, this is kind of like the, the next best thing. Um And so in terms of like the specific temperature taking, so ideally, yeah, you would get a minimum of five hours of uninterrupted sleep and you would take your temperature upon waking and then you would kind of plot it each day and you would get a sense. So, I mean, for a lot of women, I mean, for for pretty much all of us, like every day is not this perfect day. I've got kids. So it's (laughs) not like, you know, and sometimes I got to pee in the middle of the night. So it's not always perfect. So my advice uh, is kind of different to, you know, every, everyone has an opinion, but I've been teaching women for a really long time and I've been charting for a really long time. And I believe that fertility awareness has to fit into your life. Like you shouldn't be getting up at six o'clock on a Saturday morning just to take your temperature because I think sleep is more important than that. Um, and so what I teach my clients when we're talking about temperature is to just, we we have to kind of let go of this idea that the chart is going to be perfect mm-hmm. because it's not. There's no, like, how many times in your life did you have 30 days where every day was perfect? Like, that doesn't even make sense. Um, (laughs) I'd like one. One one perfect day. (laughs) So the first thing is to, like, let that go and just, like, let it go. Just enough. The second thing is to, um, to start to understand that the temperature can fluctuate, uh, differently from different, with different people. And you kind of try to figure out what has an effect on your temperature. So let me give you an example. For some women, getting up to pee in the middle of the night is going to like throw their temperatures off. And for other women, it doesn't necessarily make that big of a difference. So what I suggest is to chart your temperature every day, even when it's not perfect, even when you get up early, even when you get up later, even when, you know, just take it anyways. Because when you start to do that, you start to get a sense of what actually does affect your temperature versus what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And the key is to just make a little note in the comment, like got up to pee or, you know, whatever, whatever happened, you know, you know, kid woke me up or, or whatever. But that's my suggestion because once you get a handle on some of those basic things, you start to recognize what is really going to affect your temperature or what isn't. Now, for some women, um, their lives are such that the temperature is just not realistic. So for some women who work during the night and they kind of like they do shift work and sometimes, uh, or for some women, you just had a baby, you're breastfeeding. And like, I mean, (laughs) there's just some times when the temperature isn't isn't going to work effectively. So some women in those cases will turn to devices like, you know, there's lots of devices now that you can wear that will, you know, measure your temperature all night and spit on an average. So it'll give you like a, an average sleep temperature or something like that. Um, and so for a lot of women that's helpful because then that, like those devices use algorithms to spit out temperatures that always look perfect. And so typically like your chart, you'll be able to detect the the rise a little bit easier with those devices because they just kind of spit out these, you know what I mean? Like the device. That sounds really convenient. Exterior. I wish I had known yeah. about that one. They probably weren't around when, when I was doing the fertility awareness because I was, I feel like I have to stay still. My alarm went off, stay still, grab my, temp, grab my thermometer. It, yeah. It's just the, the rigidness that I, I probably instilled more rigidness than it was necessary. <laughs> 
Well, there's a lot of information out there. And that's why I kind of, you know, my advice, it tends to be a little bit different because I'm in the trenches. I'm in the field, Mm -hmm. right? I'm supporting women to do this. And, and it doesn't, it's not like, I know it's serious, but to some extent, it's not that serious. Like, because what, and like, I'll just, what I mean by that is that what the way I look at the chart, because I've been charting for so many years, is that any one day isn't the end of the world. Like it's, it's fine because what you're doing is your picture. Yeah. Like at the, when, when I'm working with someone like, yeah, there's always weird stuff. Every chart, there's always something you get sick, you you get on a plane, you're in a different time zone, whatever. But when you look at the whole picture of the chart at the end, so when you have the whole chart in front of you and you're trying to interpret it, Mm -hmm. you can still see the pattern as long as you're doing, you know, you're, you're taking your temperatures regularly. You try to do it around the same time every day. You know, I would say within an hour or two, but again, we have the ideal situation and then we have like the realistic day to day. And so what I say is like, I, I, I have had women who say like, I get up every day at five for work. And so then they're getting up at five on a Saturday, taking their temperature, going back to bed, like what you could like, or (laughs) you you could, um, wake up when you wake up and take your temperature then and make a note on your chart. I've had clients for whom they get up an hour or two early, earlier or later, and it makes a huge difference on their chart. And I've had other clients where it kind of makes a difference, but it's not like, like you can still read it. You can understand it because with your notes, you can interpret it. It's fine. So don't make your a slave to this awareness Absolutely chart not. because life is no. more important. I want Correct. to switch a little bit to, because this podcast is so much about birth and babies, I want to talk a little bit about conception. Um, so we already talked about, you know, knowing your fertility time and when you're most likely to conceive, but what are some common health conditions that you've seen that can disrupt, um, conception? Mm-hmm. Um, disrupt conception, disrupt the menstrual cycle, both. Uh, let's all, let's go with that. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting because I mean, my, like the whole, like, so for instance, like the book, my argument is that, um, I'm arguing that the menstrual cycle is a vital sign. Um, and I mean, this is an idea that, that it's not like a new idea. There's a lot of different, um, uh, individuals, like w- even within my own like training as a fertility awareness educator, I first became acquainted with this idea at the very early stages of my learning about this, um, because the menstrual cycle reflects your overall health to you, which mm-hmm. is really an interesting concept. Because then all of a sudden it means that menstruation is actually important, and um, it's a sign of health. So for women of reproductive age, having healthy periods and regular um, healthy cycles is a reflection of health. So, you know, what what I mean by that is that if you're having a health issue, you know, in one way or another, uh, it you can expect that it will show up in your menstrual cycle. Um, and so in many ways, there's a lot of different health issues that can show up in different ways. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily know unless you knew what to look for. But mm-hmm. um, so one of the most common health issues that disrupts the menstrual cycle is thyroid disorders. Mm. And so, um, and you know, women are disproportionately likely if, if someone's going to get a thyroid disorder, I believe it's at least women get thyroid disorder or are diagnosed with thyroid disorders at a rate of at least 10 to one compared to men. And especially women who are, um, you know, in that phase of pregnancy and, and lactation, uh, you know, there's a huge association with thyroid disorders and pregnancy lactation. And so um, what that can look like in the menstrual cycle. So when you're using one of those neat, handy um, sleep devices that like gives you an average sleep temperature, you're not necessarily going to see the like the the actual basal body temperature so it wouldn't necessarily alert you if your temperatures were too low but if you're actually doing it kind of old school with a regular thermometer um one of the the kind of clear signs of suboptimal thyroid function would be low temperatures on the chart so Mm. on average temperatures that are lower than like in the pre-ovulatory phase temperatures that are lower than about 97.5 degrees fahrenheit consistently Mm -hmm. or 30 36.4 36.4 degrees Celsius consistently. So typically it's like the bottom of the chart <laughs> um, consistently. Like you just, it's, you're always running low and you might have other signs of it. Um, sometimes thyroid disorders can show up with um, like issues with the menstrual cycle. Like maybe you have heavier periods, maybe your ovulation is delayed and you have longer cycles. Um, maybe your luteal phase is a bit shorter because that can indicate um lower hormone function. So there's different ways that it can show up uh, for thyroid. Um, Women that have 
polycystic ovarian syndrome, for example, um, that shows up in the menstrual cycle chart in a very kind of classic way. So um, with polycystic ovarian syndrome, the classic way that it shows up in the menstrual cycle is long, irregular cycles. Hmm. So instead of having a cycle that would fall between, say, 24 and 35 days regularly, you might have a woman whose cycles regularly are longer than 35 days. Maybe she only has like seven, six, seven periods a year. She doesn't really know when her next period is coming. And polycystic ovary syndrome, so right in the title is like polycystic ovaries. It can give us the impression that it's an ovarian issue. Um, But really, um, women who have that uh, issue have a lot of the metabolic markers of women who you know, like a pre-diabetic woman, Hmm. Um, insulin resistance, inflammation, um, increased risk of cardiovascular issues, increased risk of developing um, diabetes later in life, as well as gestational diabetes and pregnancy. Uh, So it's really um, not an issue of the ovaries. The menstrual cycle is is kind of giving you a sign that there's an underlying metabolic issue at place. uh, I really feel like women don't think about their, what a normal healthy cycle should look like and just be like, oh, this is just my cycle. I'm really, un- I'm really crampy and uncomfortable or, or it's just scattered. You know, I think I took for granted that I just had a, you know, <laughs> still have a really healthy cycle. Like it just was my life. And because it didn't affect me, I didn't really think about it. And I think a lot of women could just think this is just what it is and not, and just take really like, it's kind of like, um, postpartum where someone could have incontinence and like, this is just what it is. You know, they don't really think they have to serve their body to fix it. They just accept like, oh, I don't know when my period's coming or, oh, it's really uncomfortable. I just take extra Advil. So looking at it as like a normal, healthy menstrual cycle can really reflect a healthy, a healthy body. I hadn't really thought of that. Yeah, I mean, for me, that came to my attention really early on, and I really resonate with what you just said. So I started charting, obviously, I was really young, and my cycles weren't like like normal. <laughs> um, my average cycle was about 40 days. 40? Yeah. And um, so that meant I was ovulating like, you know, really late in the cycle, like day 25. And so, but for me, I, I literally took that on. I was like, yeah, it's great. I, this is just me. This it's is just my cycle. Is, yeah. yeah. And then, um, so, but fortunately for me, I wasn't alone. So I was around women who had experience, as I mentioned, who, some who were certified teachers and, you know, all of that. So my, my charting instructor looked at my chart and she's like, Lisa, your temperatures are too low. Your cycles are too long. This isn't normal. Go to the doctor and get tested for thyroid. I was like, what? <laughs> What do you mean? Um, And so it turns out that because of charting, I identified a subclinical thyroid issue in my own self um, when I was like in my early 20s that who knows how long it would have taken for that to come to light. Um, And by tending to that and uh, over the years, like supporting my thyroid and my body, like it never progressed, you know, into because my doctor- Because you caught it early. Yeah. You got a sense that something was wrong in your body. Yeah. I just think that was a light bulb moment for me. I'm like, oh, of course. I, you know, I've just taken for granted. This is just my body. And I'm like the freak person that I'm pretty like 28 days. I'm like the weird, um, you know, textbook. So that's good. No, no, it's good. I'm sure it's going to, as I get into my, you know, forties, it's going to change, but, but you know, I'm pretty much in set o'clock by it, but I think I just took that for granted. That's just like, my body, but other people, and then other people that don't have that can just be like, get yeah, like you did at 40 days. Like, yeah, I guess it's just my body. So what about, um, cause again, my, my clientele tends in my community tends to look at conception. So could there be something that's lingering that could also disrupt conception in, in a cycle? Well, so anything that disrupts the cycle. So even in the two examples that I gave, which, you know, thyroid disorders or, um, polycystic ovary syndrome. So they would each present a unique challenge. Um, So for instance, with thyroid disorders, I mean, our bodies are designed in a really interesting way. As I mentioned, after ovulation, your temperature actually goes up. And that means that in order for you to get pregnant, your body is supposed to be at a certain temperature. It's important enough that after ovulation, your temperature rises on the chart. Mm -hmm. So if you have a thyroid issue that's not addressed, and you, your, you know, your your body temperature, your metabolism is literally too low, like you're too cold. Women with thyroid disorders are much more likely to experience miscarriages and have mm. difficulty conceiving. It's in, it's right there in the literature. Um, and so, just with that in mind, uh, one of, I remember I did a, a class once. So I, I did these ten, ten week, you know, 
this group program and I teach women to chart and I had one group of women who were trying to conceive and another who um, were avoiding pregnancy. And I remember I had this one group this one time and I swear it was like 70% of the group had issues with their thyroid, either fully diagnosed or their temp, like their charts were like the temperatures were super low. You could, you know, markers on the, like, I'm basically saying like, okay, you need to go to your practitioner and get this checked out. Right. But it was like a significant percentage of women. And it really struck me that, yeah, I mean, this is a really common um, issue. So that's an example. Polycystic ovary syndrome, as I mentioned, these women, one of the classic signs on the the chart and in the menstrual cycle is these long irregular cycles. So I mentioned that there's about a you know, six day window in your cycle when you can get pregnant. If your cycle is 64 days, <laughs> 60. you have, no, but that's a real thing. Um, so like not for every woman with polycystic ovary syndrome, but I mean, it's not uncommon for a cycle to be 50 days or 40 days or, and kind of fluctuate. And we're talking you, someone like in their twenties, thir- thirties, yes, yes. cause I would assume like as someone gets into, I don't know, forties, fifties, it's going to elongate. Or is this, I mean, right? <laughs> um, well, so let's, we can chat. So basically um, what's really interesting is that like the first couple years after your period, like, so, you know, like say the first four years after your very first period, yeah, there's a period of time where your cycle is like maturing and normalizing. So yeah, in that period, like that's a kind of a period where you'd expect cycles to some, sometimes be a little shorter, sometimes be a little longer. So for women during the pre-menopause period, so that would be the 10 years before your last period, um, there's a few different trends that can take place. And so what often happens for women is that maybe their cycles will start to shorten a little bit. So you've always had a 28-day cycle, but all of a sudden ovulation will start happening earlier in the cycle. And maybe your cycles will go, you know, 27, 26, 25, 24, even 21 days. I'm just trying to get a sense, like if someone's in their kind of their the birthing phase of their life, if they should not expect like a 60 day, that's just like clearly saying something's wrong. Well, absolutely. Like, so there's no scenario where like a 60 day cycle is optimal. (laughs) That's just not a thing. When you said 60, my ears were like, what? (laughs) But but I was giving that as an example, you know, to, to, to kind of, um, like your question was around what, what, how could these conditions, um, affect your chances? Yeah. Yeah. I guess I hadn't, yeah. Yeah, because you've always had regular cycles, it's hard for you to imagine a woman not having a period for two months, but it's a real thing. And so there's a lot of women out there who have this particular challenge who this, when I'm saying that, they're like, well, yeah. (laughs) This is fantastic. I think you're shedding light because I'm sure there's a lot of (laughs) listeners that are like, of course, Deb, stop being an idiot. Like, of course. (laughs) And I'm just stuck in my own bubble of knowing, because you know, I don't think we talk about this enough. My friends and I talk about birth a lot, but I don't think we've ever sat and said like, what's your cycle like? So this is great. This is getting people to to um, relate and acknowledge and maybe even start more of a conversation. Well, absolutely. And then kind of going back to that example, if there's only like a six day window in your whole cycle where you can get pregnant, it makes it a lot harder to hit that window. Yeah. So there's kind of like this idea, of course, that women with polycystic ovary uh, syndrome are infertile or won't be able to get pregnant, um, which isn't which isn't true. It's, it's complex. So you have to kind of address, like the, the, if you think of the cycle as a vital sign, if the cycle is 60 days, what that literally means is that your ovulation is delayed for a really long time. And that the reason that your ovulation de- is delayed in that particular health issue is typically a combination of inflammation, um, you know, insulin resistance, like meaning that you're when you're consuming sugar, it's like, if you think about it as like a cousin of like actual, you know, diabetes or something Mm -hmm. like that, like a metabolic condition, there's all of these other factors. Your body's really having a hard time um, because you might have a predisposition to um, just not deal well with sugar um, that then disrupts the cycle. So there's a reason why ovulation is delayed. There's something that is happening um, that is causing your ovaries to basically say, nope, we're not doing this right now. And so from a functional perspective, you would want to figure out what is going on there in terms of improving fertility so that we can get the cycle back to a healthier, you know, 24 to 35 day range Mm -hmm. and have ovulation happening more regularly. But from a very practical standpoint, you, if you're not charting and you're not watching for mucus and your cycles are just really long, what are the chances that you're just going to randomly hit the right day? Correct. Yeah. And then get frustrated if you're trying to conceive. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and then what, I mean, and then you go to your traditional doctor and really what medicine has for women with these conditions are different types of medications that sensitize the body to insulin and also medications that force ovulation. So that I was just thinking that like my friend had Clomid, um, to help her. She had a very, um, very scattered cycle and she had, and she had some issues and then with the Clomid, but so that was kind of where, is that what the typical process is or is that just because I'm aware of it? Well, I mean, that's the way, like, so if you're, if this is an issue that you have and you go to your typical doctor, you know, the way medicine is, they're not like most regular classically trained doctors are not thinking, oh, well, you probably have, like, they're thinking, like, we, let's change your diet, whatever. Like, they're thinking about, okay. Let's get you ovulating. Let's get you ovulating. I have a drug. I can make you ovulate. Let's get this going. So, um, so yeah, like this is, but it's just different ways of looking at the same issue. Obviously that if you take Clomid, it doesn't, it get, it can make you, it, it, that's what it does. Like it makes 70% of women who take it, like go on to ovulate. Um, so yeah, like you, it makes you ovulate, but it doesn't actually correct the actual the problem. Issue. What is the why? Why is yes. the cycle 60 days instead of, okay, we'll force a cycle on. Yeah. Um, well, and, and there's no, like, the, it's a complicated conversation when you're trying to conceive, you're trying to conceive. Like, if I can take this drug, it's going to make me ovulate. If I conceive, it's great. But Clomid, it's, in itself, we could have a conversation about that because Clomid <laughs> is a very interesting drug. The way that it works is it desensitizes your, your cells to estrogen. So basically, um, you when your body isn't correctly perceiving how much estrogen is there, so then you just keep making it, and that's what eventually triggers ovulation. One of the challenges with Clomid is that it has negative effects on fertility. So it, um, because of the way that it it changes how your body perceives estrogen, um, it's been like that particular drug has been shown to reduce the like thin out the uterine lining, which is kind of important when you're trying to have a baby. Yeah, um, and also to reduce cervical mucus production. So it's a drug like a fertility drug that actually kind of has negative impact. Right. So if we need that mucus to help draw the sperm in and keep it healthy and, and moving. So now we're drying it out a little bit. So while you're, if I'm understanding this correctly, it's forcing ovulation, but it's not helping the process other than that. Well, yeah. And I mean, we like every, everything we do has positives and negatives. So there are women who conceive on Clomid and I mean, that's that's like, that's the, that's the whole point. Right. But again, it's this kind of interplay between like, what are the trade-offs? Like, what is it doing? Cause I've worked with women who have, you know, been through the IVF and IUIs and like the Clomid and all of that. And they're, lo- they're obviously coming to me cause they're looking for like, okay, I've had all of the drugs and I just want to know what my cycle's like. I just want a minute. I need to kind of like take a minute to kind of, I want to do a little bit more holistic stuff for a while. Um, so they're coming to me for that. And, um, I've worked with women who've had multiple rounds of some of these fertility drugs who like, it takes their, their bodies months to start making mucus again. Hmm. This so is it's so like interesting. Whole... I'm just fascinated by this. It's not an area I had really jumped into more than just like supporting friends through, but now I'm, you have definitely <laughs> piqued my interest. I want to shift a little bit to something I hear my students talk about a lot. I also get some sheepish looking smiles, walk back in the door when I'm like, your baby's six months. Congratulations. Welcome back. Um, we talk about how effective is breastfeeding as contraception? Break some myths. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it's really it's really interesting. So, I mean, breastfeeding by itself, um, I, I I could not trust that just by itself as as contraception, um, and that's because there's variation in how, like, every woman's body is different, and also, um, you know, no two women get their cycles back uh, at the same time, and so. Um, and also it's, it's very dependent. So there is something to be said for the fact that breastfeeding does inhibit ovulation for a period of time, you know, in most women. So there is something to be said for that. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, as you are breastfeeding, you know, when the baby is suckling, it's stimulating oxytocin production. It's stimulating, you know, you're producing prolactin. Um, you know, that's what's triggering your milk production. And those hormones have this kind of feedback effect that, that do suppress ovulation. Um, and so, for just in the general, like for information's sake, for women who are exclusively breastfeeding and they're breastfeeding on demand and they have lots of skin to skin contact, they're more likely to have their, um, 
like their fertility and their cycle suppressed for a longer period of time. Can I pause on that one thing and say, I want to highlight that you said exclusively breastfeeding and breastfeeding on demand. Um, So I want, if I had like, if this was in print, it would be in big, bold letters with a highlighter around it and some underlining. Um, It seems like breastfeed, like the baby's only, like you are, um, my friend called herself the like mobile, what did she call it? It was really cute. It was like mobile milk unit or something like that move. Um, But you are the son. Sustenance. Yeah, my friend Lily Nichols in her book um, "Real Food for Pregnancy," she refers to herself as podcast with her. She's wonderful. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. It's like M M U Mobile Milk Unit. Um, So if you are like, yeah, I love that you you highlighted that because people have selective hearing. Yeah, (laughs) so it's like they're like, of course I'm breastfeeding. I mean, I give a bottle every now and then, but you know, for the most part, I'm breastfeeding. So like, I wanted just to make sure we really understood that. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, yeah. So in this scenario and I believe the term for it uh you know ecological breastfeeding is a term for it but oh. this isn't to say that there's a right way so I just want to clarify like this, the reason that we're highlighting this isn't because we're saying like this is, this right is the only way this- no, no no we're saying this is when people Same. think yes okay we'll we'll go with with it. The suppressive effect on your fertility returning specifically so yes. to have that like the greatest suppressive effect on your fertility is going to take place when you are like the baby doesn't get formula. The baby only gets milk from you when the baby wants. So it's like super convenient for you. And, um, just all the skin to skin as much as you can. And so that has the, the strongest suppressive effect on your fertility. And, um, but in terms of like the actual method, so there's a method, lactation, Ooh. amenorrhea method, um, you know, even with all of that, they would, even within the first 52 days, like, so as a fertility awareness educator, I always steer away from like thinking in terms of days, like even when you asked about the average, I was like, Ooh, not comfortable <laughs> with that. Okay. Um, and so from my standpoint, um, I think what's really helpful and important for women to know, there's a, there's a few things we can go through them um, in that postpartum period. But I think the most basic fundamental thing that women, as women, we need to know is that before we ever get our first period back, um, it's it's possible to get pregnant because before you get a period, you, you have, have to, to ovulate. <laughs> Correct. And you don't and know until after. Well, I, I, I would say like possibly, um, right. because if you, so let me, I'll give myself as an example, maybe that'll like, I, I love giving examples as you can tell. So beca- for, in my example, when I had my first son, I had been charting my cycles at that point for already like something like 12 years or something like that. Um, so what that means is I had been for years and years and years, very familiar with, um, my cervical mucus production as I approach ovulation. Like I'm very clear about the signs of ovulation and just the general cycle of my body. And so, um, that means for me when I was postpartum, because I had that charting experience, I was like on top of that. So in my postpartum period, I was checking for mucus like I normally would. Cause after 12 years of doing something, it's like you, even if you try not to do it, you can't not do it. Um, but basically in my case, what I was looking for was the return of my fertility. So I wasn't waiting for my period. I was actually looking for my like signs of ovulation. I was looking for my mucus. And so for me, I actually was not surprised by my period because I saw my mucus return. Well, so that makes before- sense, of course, because, yeah, I'm just wondering, like, the average person, if they're not charting and they're not aware, they're just, <laughs> yeah, they're just like, oh, here it comes. Yeah. Well, and here's the kicker. So you hear, because I'm sure you've heard this a lot. So you tell me if you've heard this a lot. Okay. Um, a lot of women will say like, we only did it once, right? <laughs> it only takes <did> once. <laughs> and I'm pregnant. But the thing is that the there's other things that happen. So as you approach ovulation now, you know, there's people, I, I you know, I've, I've, there's, there's researchers that would say like, not every woman is super horny around ovulation. We're not just, you know, slaves to our hormones and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, I've been in this field long enough to know that typically around ovulation, most women will say like, that's typically when they want it, or that's typically when they find their partner the most attractive. And it works in reverse as well, because we give off pheromones that we don't even know about. And the research shows that like our partners are more likely to like the sound of our voice and be all up in our grill. So what I'm saying to you is that like when you don't, when you're not aware of any of this stuff, it's interesting because you're like, if there was going to be one time that you're going to do like to have sex, if there was going to be one time, it's very likely to be around that time. Um, so, I mean, 
the way that I talk about fertility awareness postpartum uh, is very carefully because you know, fertility awareness is an effective method of birth control for women who know what they're doing and understand and are charting in a very specific way. So I use a specific method of charting. Fertility awareness isn't just this thing. There's like multiple different types of fertility awareness based methods. And there's different, like, so there's when you're learning methods, there's teachers that teach you different ways to do it. And so for example, like when I'm charting my cycles, like I'm looking, I'm, I'm using a charting system that I've learned and I've taught and um, I know what to look for and I understand it. And so for me, like it was, you know, I know what to look for. I know when my mucus comes back for a woman who wants to use this as as birth control, it's if she's never used fertility awareness before, it's a bit challenging to start in the postpartum because when you're just cycling normally, like you didn't just have a baby (laughs) and you're just like ovulating and having your period and repeat, repeat, um, then you have a cycle and you have this kind of trend, you, you, you notice the pattern, right? Like you have your period, you start to see mucus, you ovulate, you get your period about two weeks later, like you kind of get into this habit. Mm-hmm. When you're breastfeeding, um, you don't know when you're, you're uh, going to ovulate. So for some women, they're like, if, if you're not able to breastfeed exclusively, et cetera, et cetera, some women are going to get their period back within a month mm-hmm. or two. Um, some women who are exclusively breastfeeding might get their period back in four months or three months. Other women might get their period back in six months or eight months. Some women don't get their period back for a year. And so the, the challenge is that like, you're like, if you legitimately want to use this method, you have to be checking for because every day for a year, like for a lot of women, that's like not acceptable to them. <laughs> well, especially as a new mom where, you know, sleep, they're certainly probably not getting five hours of undisturbed sleep. Um, and their brain is just Jesus not, fear. you know, just, just not a, functioning. What was that? Temperature is useless to you. Cause yeah. the temperature only changes after ovulation. So again, year, six months, four months, no, like the temperature doesn't help you at all. Yeah. And their focus <laughs> is probably not, let me check my mucus. It probably is like, have you even brushed my teeth today? So, you know, so I think yeah. I, so let's talk then. What are, besides condoms, what are some safe hormonal contraceptives for someone while still breastfeeding? Um, well, let me, let me just provide something that's helpful with this knowledge and stuff that we're talking about for Great. women, I think just in general, because I, I basically what I'm saying is I wouldn't recommend necessarily, like for women who want to use fertility awareness, like postpartum, my recommendation is to seek the support of a trained instructor. That's really how you do it because that's in the postpartum period. It's like a special uh, circumstance where it is possible to do it. It really is, but you need to have support because you need to know what to look for. Mm-hmm. Um, in the general sense, just for general information that every woman should know, um, what you're looking for, the heads up, because it's even just nice to know when your period's coming. So you're not, because you're a busy mom, you're out and about, like you probably didn't remember to put a pad in your you beg because you haven't had a period for like a year and a half. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so it just used to be helpful just to know. So what you're looking for is, um, the return of your cervical mucus. So you're looking for, like, you're going to the bathroom. It's super slippery. You're seeing that clear, stretchy stuff. You're seeing, um, creamy white hand lotion. Like that is what you're looking for. And that is going to happen. Like assuming that you go on to ovulate, that is going to happen about two weeks before your period. And that can actually be that heads up just for that general information, not saying use it as birth control, but saying, look for that heads up. When you go into the bathroom, look for that. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's great advice because you don't want to panic. I'm just visualizing what would happen. Like you're out with your diaper bag. You're like, I'm cutting the diaper up and I'm using it as a pad. Like I'm just trying to break right? it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So from a practical standpoint, I like that's one of my favorite things about it. So I said, you know, you can't predict ovulation because ovulation is not always going to happen on the same day. But when you start to chart your cycles, you can predict when your period is coming because after ovulation, the period does come about 12 to 14 days after. And so like just as a very basic, functional, helpful piece of information. It's for me, that's wonderful throughout my life. Cause I'm not on the, I haven't been on, you know, hormones for like 20 years. So for me, I like to know when my period's coming. So I'm not like out and about and having to come out of a diaper. <laughs> <laughs> don't, have, don't have to do that. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, for me, it's, um, I, I am typically not the one that's going to recommend hormonal birth control for women. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm open to whatever a woman feels is the best option for her. So I think what 
my biggest thing about birth control is informed consent. Um, for a lot of women, especially women who were on birth control for a long time and then went off of it, you know, to get pregnant and got pregnant, this is kind of like the first time that they've really been in their bodies, mm -hmm. you know, connected to without having their hormones kind of altered and suppressed. For a lot of women, when they're on birth control, a lot of women do have negative effects, whether it's like mood, depression, anxiety, um, maybe they're, they, you know, low libido. Uh, the pill has, is known to suppress libido in a number of different ways. It suppresses your testosterone levels and those types of things. And some women experience painful sex or whatever. And so for some women, even if they try to go back on hormones post baby, they might find that they actually like being in their bodies and they don't mm -hmm. want to do it. Um, I mean, I would say it, it's really a, a personal decision. Some women do better on progestin only types of birth control because the estrogen doesn't work well with them. Um, so it's really important to kind of look at those different options. Some women, you know, are going to look at an IUD or something like that, you know, maybe the copper because it doesn't have hormones. Um, all types of birth control, there's, there's positives and negatives, uh, you know, so it's, I think that it's really just important to kind of look at the different options. Um, it's complicated. I mean, a lot of people don't like condoms, right? Because they don't like the way they feel. Mm -hmm. Some couples are totally fine with condoms. Some couples aren't. Um, there's barrier methods, uh, you know, like the diaphragm or cervical cap. Again, some women are comfortable with those. Some women might use something like that and combine it with withdrawal or with condoms. Mm -hmm. And withdrawal is like a super dirty word that, you know, like people don't want to talk about. But being in the field that I'm in, I know a lot of couples use it. And a lot of women kind of under their breath, like in a, like a bubble of shame, like we use withdrawal, but at the end of the day, like we're adults. So we have to be able to have an adult conversation. There's a lot of couples that, that do rely on it. And so for instance, in my book, I talk about, I talk about like what the research says, which is kind of inconclusive. So it, the research would suggest that it works for some couples and maybe not others because, um, there's no clear answer as to whether or not like some men have sperm in their pre-ejaculate, which is the big question with that. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, like what I talk about is like, you have to be able to use it correctly. Like any method, any method you use, you have to use it correctly. If you're using uh, the pill, you have to take it at the right time. If you're using a condom, you have to know how to use it properly. You can't be using it with olive oil and coconut oil because that shreds <laughs> the condom. To, yeah, the, Apparently the lack, people don't yeah. know that. I, I had no idea. I thought this was common knowledge. I did a, um, I was in New York uh, at this event with um, like Laura Bryden and Nicole Jardim and Jessica Drummond. And I did, like I put a condom over my hand and I was like rubbing it with coconut oil for a while. And someone else was talking and I'm sitting there rubbing the thing and eventually it snapped. Waiting for it to yeah, deteriorate. Yeah. Or, yeah. And the whole audience was like, ah! and I was like, you didn't know that? <laughs> So like a big part of any type of birth control you use, you have to use it correctly, right? So um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I think yeah. um, at the end of the day, it's, a, it's, it, it, it's hard. It's always hard. And especially for women who always use the pill, they never had to have conversations with their partner around that. Like it was just taken care of. So I think a lot of it can just be the kind of um, anxiety around having to actually deal with it and having to have conversations around it and having to acknowledge that I think this is what I find most interesting for women who come off the pill and they don't want to get pregnant, but they don't want to be on the pill. So they have to find other ways to manage their fertility. And all of a sudden they have to have these conversations with their partners. Like what would happen if I got pregnant? And I'm always like, but you know that people can get pregnant on the pill. Like it's a very small percentage, but you know that like there's no birth control method that's totally like infallible. There are women who get IUDs put in and get pregnant. Yeah, actually, I had a very good friend that happened to. She she ended up having a third surprise. Um, you know, I totally I can relate to the once someone gets in their body because for a lot of people, pregnancy is one of the first times they're really connecting to their body because you know they're growing a baby and they're extra aware. And for some, not all, once they hit that and maybe they'd been on a hormonal contraceptive, it just doesn't feel right for them to go back after. I've seen that time and time again. I went off the pill and, and like when I think I just turned 30 and I'd been on it for 10 years at that point and never again after that, never again. I had a horrible reaction from coming off it. Like my skin broke out. It just, it was, it just was not suiting me after that. So I can relate to somebody being like, nope, not going there. So I'm glad you offered a lot of options because someone that's postpartum and hit that new stride, they just may not want to go back there. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard for a, a number of different reasons. And I think one of the reasons it's challenging is that it's, it's, it's a social norm for us to 
to use birth control. And so even if you decide for yourself, like, I don't really want to use hormones, they don't really work for me. Um, if you try to have that conversation with your healthcare practitioner often, like, especially for women who want to use fertility awareness, because basically I've spoken to so many women that are essentially laughed out of their doctor's offices. Doctors are not really taught a whole lot about fertility awareness methods, and they're lumped in with the rhythm method. And the effectiveness, if you ever look up effectiveness online, you'll see it look like it's listed at 75%. Um, and what they do is they just lump in like they lump in women who are literally like, I learned from a teacher and I use a specific charting method <laughs> right. methodology with the woman who like has a charting app that like tells her when her period is coming. Right. They lump them all together. Um, and so like what the actual research says about the fertility awareness method is that, so there was, you know, there's a research study that was done with women who were taught a specific method by trained teachers. So the symptothermal method is basically what we were talking about today, which is combining your daily observations with the temperature. So mm -hmm. you, you have like additional signs to kind of cross-reference between each other. Um, and so the the effectiveness rate of the fertility awareness method in that study was 99.4%. And so that means, and when you think about what we talked about earlier, when we were talking about like how it works and what is the fertility awareness method and blah, 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 like the physiology, if there's only a small window of time that you can get pregnant in your cycle and you're able to accurately identify that window and you put a buffer period around it for safety, then really like if you only can get pregnant on those days and you don't have unprotected sex on those days, then you can't get pregnant. Like it's science. It's like a real thing. And there are women who successfully use this method their whole lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't make up the, the norm of the majority by any means, but we, including myself, are out there. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and really it's, 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 the world that kind of has to catch up to that because the challenge is that there's no one birth control method for all women. Some women are going to want to not be on hormones and are going to want to chart their cycles. Some women are going to want to take the pill. Some women are going to want to use an IUD. Some women are going to want to use withdrawal. Like we have to be able to have adult conversations about that so that there's not only one option that's presented to us. Right. And as a fertility awareness educator, kind of one of the things that we try to get out is that, you know what, it's not for everybody, but it's a, it's actually highly effective. The research shows that women are not stupid. We're not dummies. So we're capable of learning it for women who know that this is what they want to do. They're highly motivated to learn it. And from my experience teaching women over the years within about, you know, one to three cycles, like, so if I'm working with someone by the time they're on their second cycle that we're going through together, they get it. And it just gives another option. So, you know, all throughout pregnancy and birth, we're trying, I'm trying to work with my community about autonomy and make choices. So it's just another choice and taking control of your body. So I love that, you know, it's not one size fits all. It's not only one option. It's just another educated choice. On that note, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'm going to ask you your final piece of advice um, for either parents trying to conceive or new parents. So let's take a momentary break. Waiting on a tax return? Hopefully it ends up in your hands. Fraudulent tax returns due to identity theft increased by 30% in 2023. If you're in a bind this tax season, LifeLock can help. Our U.S.-based restoration specialists are experts dedicated to helping solve your identity theft issues. And all LifeLock plans are backed by the Million Dollar Protection Package. So we'll reimburse you up to the limits of your plan if you lose money due to identity theft. Help protect your information this tax season with LifeLock. Save up to 25% your first year at LifeLock.com slash aware. And we're back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what is that final piece of advice that you have for either trying to conceive or new parents? Hmm. Um, for trying to conceive, I would say um, learn how to chart your cycles and really focus on the role of cervical mucus. Um, ignore the advice of having sex on a certain day of your cycle and start to really learn about the signs that your body gives you. Good. Okay. What about for new parents? Um, for new parents, what would my advice be for Sleep. new parents? Okay. <laughs> I would say, I mean, I think that there's a bit pretty big issue in our culture uh, where we don't really, well, first of all, like it starts even in fertility. We don't really acknowledge a preconception period. We don't really 
stress the importance of going into pregnancy with good nourishment, things like that. Um, that would really, I mean, that sets us up to have healthy babies, but it also sets us up to be healthy moms. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us go into pregnancy after, you know, years on birth control or, you know what I mean? Like we're not always the, our best selves. (laughs) Um, you know, we try to be, but you know what I'm saying? So post, um, post baby, I think, uh, there's a lot of attention on baby, but we really need to try to focus on mom. So if anything for, for new parents, it's really trying to get that support that you need. You need people making meals for you. You need people taking care of you. You need, um, you need basically support so that you can be the best mom. I feel like that's not very succinct, but, um, I think you can tell what I'm trying to say. Cause yes. I feel like it's a really big issue for new moms. We just don't necessarily get the support that we need. Um, both actual people and hands, but also like nutrition, nourishment. Um, recognize that having a baby is probably one of the most, um, one of the times in your life where really you have the highest nutritional needs, like you have the highest emotional nutritional needs. It takes a lot out of you quite literally and figuratively. And so, you know, as a new parent, it's hard to find time for yourself, but most women go on to have more babies. So it's really important to take that time to really replenish your nutrients, nourish your body as best as you can so that you can be the best mom and also to prepare yourself if you're planning to have more than one. I love that. And where can people find your work? Well, thank you for that. Um, So the book is The Fifth Vital Sign, Master Your Cycles and Optimize Your Fertility. Um, I really went to town and included over a thousand you know, research citations in there. The book is available on Amazon in paperback and ebook format. And um, the you can actually get the first chapter for free over at the fifth vital sign book.com. Um, I have a podcast, Fertility Friday. So whatever your favorite podcast app, you can search for me, search Fertility Friday, and I'm the first that comes up. And and yeah, I'm around. I'm in the places. Yay. And so I'll make sure that I have all of that on our show notes, a link to your podcast, obviously a link to your book. And if people want to learn even more about you, they can dive in. I also have your full bio up on the show notes. So I wanted to thank you because I really enjoyed this talk. It's something I meant like, it's just, I hadn't put a lot of thought into it. Um, I took for granted that my body was able to go on the norm. And you really enlightened me and I'm hoping enlightened our community. And especially if someone's having difficulty conceiving, stepping back and and looking at their whole body as health. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun chatting with you. I loved your questions. (laughs) No, it was really fun. Thank you so much. It It was awesome. All right. Well, take care. Bye. Bye. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.